Matt 1314, Tyler Junior College, section 2.7, inverse functions. Determining if a function has an inverse. So in the previous video, the video where I started eating an apple, I finished it between videos. We verified that two functions were not inverses. The functions were f of x equals x squared and g of x equals the square root of x. And the problem with that pair was the first function, f of x equals x squared. So we're going to attempt to answer how to determine if a function has an inverse by exploring why didn't f of x equals x squared have an inverse, but f of x equals x squared if x is greater than or equal to zero, we'll put all that in quotes, does have an inverse. In other words, if we restricted the domain of the function, to all non-negative real numbers. There's a few reasons why. One of them is algebraic, the other two are graphical in nature. The problem with f of x equals x squared algebraically is two inputs had equal outputs. The example that I used was seven. Putting in 7 was the same as putting in negative 7. Now, why is this a problem? Because if both of these numbers turn into the same answer, 49, the inverse function doesn't know what to turn the 49 back into. It can't turn it back into both 7 and negative 7. It's a function. It can only turn 49 into one value at a time. That's not the case over here. Here, Different inputs guarantee different outputs. Or equivalently, if your outputs match, then your inputs match. So in reverse, equal outputs guarantee equal inputs. Here, equal outputs did not guarantee equal inputs. This is a characteristic of functions known as one-to-one. -one. Think of it as an adjective. A function is one-to-one -one if equal outputs, so f of x1 equals f of x2, implies equal inputs. In other words, the only way two things can come out the same is if they went in the same. In this case, I had two things coming out the same, but they were different to begin with. Not gonna happen over here. So algebraically speaking, you would say that f of x equals x squared is not one to one. And by the way, the phrase one to one means one x to one y, not two x's to one y. This function could be called two to one because it can take two different x's and produce the same y value. So this function is not one-to-one, -one, which is the reason it failed to have an inverse. Now, by contrast, this one will. There is only one number I can put in here to get 49, and that is 7. What about negative 7? I restricted to the domain. There is no negative 7 over here. So this function, f of x equals x squared if x is greater than or equal to 0, is one to one. Now I will admit that proving two functions is are one to one. Excuse me, proving a function is one to one is not something that we're going to do in this class. For those of you going into future math classes, you will be proving that functions are one to one. But from an algebraic perspective, that's why squaring failed to have an inverse, but squaring with the restricted domain did have an inverse. If I just say square I can have two, output, two inputs with equal outputs, but I can't have them over there. The other two approaches are graphical in nature. In fact, the other two approaches, at least for my college algebra class, are the approaches that I'm going to ask you to use to answer the question, do you have an inverse? In fact, I'm only going to ask you one of them. In order to get you to see them, I'm going to quickly sketch the graphs of both of these functions. There's the squaring function in its entirety. Here's the squaring function when it was limited to non-negative numbers. 
Visually speaking, what was the problem? Well, the problem here with the sevens was there were two X's that had the same Y. Two X's that had the same Y. Both negative and seven and seven went up to 49. That was not a problem over here. The only number that went up to 49 in this function was seven. I'm not drawn to scale, by the way. So how can we spot this, this, this thing visually? Well, there's two ways to spot it. One is in terms of increasing and decreasing. Notice that this first graph starts out decreasing and then it changes direction and goes increasing. If a graph changes direction, you will always change directions vertically. You will always be able to find two points or more that have the same y value but different x values. Even if this didn't go all the way up there, even if this had just briefly turned and gone back this way, then right here, there's one, two, three x values that have the same y value. And that happened because the graph changed directions. It went from decreasing to increasing, as opposed to this graph, which does not change directions. It is strictly increasing. So from a graphical perspective, you can say that f of x has an inverse if its graph is, and I'm going to have to borrow a calculus word, continuous, but for our purposes, what that basically means is it's one complete piece, not two or more pieces like the graph of the reciprocal function. If it is continuous and always increasing or decreasing. One or the other, but not both. There is an adjective for a graph that is always going in one direction vertically. It's called monotone. Always going up or always going down. So that's another way to answer, do you have an inverse? You're not, your graph is continuous, it's not broken into multiple pieces, and it's continually going up or continually going down. But even that's not the way that I'm going to hold my students accountable for who are currently taking my college algebra class. Because the easiest way is to look at the graph and realize that if you have two points with the same y value but different x values, then they can be joined by a horizontal line. The third way is called the horizontal line test. And the horizontal line test goes something like this. A function f of x has an inverse if and only if, and that means it has an inverse if this happens, that means if it has an inverse then this happens, and if this happens then it has an inverse, you can't have one without the other. A function f of x has an inverse if and only if it cannot be intersected more than once by any horizontal line. This is equivalent to the vertical line test. The vertical line test answers the question, are you a function? The horizontal line test says, if you're a function, are you invertible? Horizontal line. Because I can hit that graph more than once with the horizontal line, the graph does not represent a function that has an inverse. So hit it twice, not invertible. By contrast, no matter where I hit this graph with the horizontal line, it will always hit it just once, since it cannot be intersected more than once with the horizontal line. That does represent a function that has an inverse. So the horizontal line test is the easiest way to answer the question, do you have an inverse, assuming you have access to the graph. Cross it twice, the answer is no, you don't. Cross it once, the answer is yes, you do have an inverse.